the liberation of the Afghan women. Yes, saving, and saving, so I think that's, that's right, Sa saving to. Afghan women from mm -hmm. Afghan men and, you know, saving, basically, as Guy Jusbibak put it, uh, mm -hmm. brown women from brown men. Yes, yes. Um, so it seemed to me that, that, you know, useful as their analysis was and interesting as it was, that it, it didn't actually, you know, address with these questions that didn't suddenly emerge after 9-11. They came to the fore. Mm -hmm. Certainly, in a way that they hadn't before. Mm -hmm. In a way that they hadn't before. Uh, so for me, I guess, you know, I wasn't, I mean, that wasn't where I was really trying to uh, engage more uh, 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 in greater depth with their work, which I want to do in, my, in, in the book that I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, my, my real, uh, I was trying to kind of theorize race and gender in the war on terror and, mm -hmm. and, and how did Negri's work has had such an, a big impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was one of the criticisms that I kind of continue to have of that work. Yeah. In your book, you say that the, uh, that the terrorist attacks against Western powers in recent history have largely been in direct response to the imperialist aggressions of colonial occupations of particular powers. And um, you know, certainly you've, you've got a list of, of examples, and I don't think there's too many people that would disagree with you in, in this room anyhow. Um, but I'm just wondering, the the idea here of of imperial aggression um, and uh, imperial empire, um, th something struck me about that, uh, it, sort of in terms of, of what we were talking about. Um, after the attacks, like 9-11, uh, in Canada, we know that there was the Gurdwardas and, and uh, mosques, and Hindu temples, uh, 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 synagogues were attacked and, and, and people attacked. Um, so it, what you're saying, I, I think, is, is very important. It was always already there. But this idea of imperialism, um, is it really about imperialism? I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is the link between imperialism and sort of white supremacy um, would seem to me that these things between civility and savagery or, or barbarism and the idea between, uh, between a, you know, white man's burden, th these are playing themselves out as a part of this imperialism. It's not simply an imperialism when you think of something like uh, imperial Rome or, or other things in the past. So do you see a link between the idea of, of imperialism and, uh, and uh, I guess, a white supremacy or global racism Within the within the sort of historical notion of, of modernity, mm -hmm. um, like, like can those things really be separated out? I guess I don't think they can be separated out, and I don't think in the context of Canada and the U.S. they cannot be separated out at all. They cannot be separated out at all. If you look at Canada and the U.S., they basically are white settler societies. They're white settler societies, which, as Imani Banerjee argues, are trying to transform themselves into liberal democracies. But they are white settler societies, and of course, racialization and, and white supremacy are at the heart mm -hmm. of the formation of the settler society. In Canada, we know it's what a mere. Um, uh, 400 years? No, no, no. I'm talking about sort of, you know, the, the move towards becoming a liberal democracy. Oh, sorry. Really, since the not first settler society. 30 years? 30 years? Yeah. Yeah. Right? 30 years until 30, 40 years ago. It was very much keep Canada as a white man's country. Keep Canada white was, was, you know, the history until the 1960s, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's when it starts to change. So we've had 30, 35, 40 years of, you know, Canada defining itself or attempting to become a, a, a liberal democracy. Uh, so I don't think in the case of white settler societies that, that you know, you can, you can remove uh, the kind of uh, racialized power relations and, and the way in which modernity is kind of modernity or, or the development of capitalism takes place, you cannot separate. They're inseparable in the context of, of U.S. And, and Canadian history. I, you know, I don't know how, what it would look like to think or how you could even theoretically imagine that they could be separated. So, you know, they're so kind of fundamental to, to the whole nation, national project. And I think they continue to remain so. But I'm also thinking about the, the way in which Canada gets defined um, is is not only uh, through the notion of, of internal but also external. So through the concept of uh, we also define ourselves through uh, outside of our borders in terms of how we see things internationally. 
So the role that we play in Haiti or Somalia or Afghanistan and the concept of, of peacekeepers is as much a, a part of that identity, the That's construction right. of that That's identity, right. yes. as is as is the, the notion of settler society and, and what I see as a, a type of genocide against Aboriginal peoples. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, it would seem to me that Canada is implicit in the, in the in a type of imperialism outside of itself, not just internal uh, imperialism, yes. but an external uh, uh, imperialism as well. Yes. Um, and so I, I guess my question was more directed toward that sort of element as well. Yeah. Well, in terms of the role Canada plays internationally, I don't think you can, you know, remove the element of white supremacy from that either, right? If that's your question, whether, you know, uh, uh, um, outside Canada there, there is a possibility of separating them out. Am I understanding your question I guess I, correctly? You are. I guess my, I guess <coughs> really what struck me is that why, why say imperialism at all? Um, it, 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 that's, that's already sort of well, uh, well situated historically within a lot of work. Um, maybe but not the imperialism and race. That's what no. I'm trying to do. Yes, that's what I'm trying to theorize here, the relationship between. Yeah. So yes, I mean, imperialism is certainly, yes, there, there, it has received a lot of attention. It's been theorized in, in numerous ways. But the relationship between imperialism, race, and gender is what I'm interested in, in the Canadian context. Oh, let me let me Refer come back to that. Okay. Or, or mm -hmm. um, in regard to your the title of your book, which is Exalted Subjects, and of course your whole focus on the subject of identity, um, I see a kind of a basic uh, kind of contradiction where, on the one hand, you're saying that identity is a subject, and on the other hand, you're saying identity is an object, where your identity is inscribed upon you. Mm -hmm from the outside, so to speak, and that you have as an individual, whether you're, whether you're aboriginal, whether you're black or white, doesn't matter. But it, it almost takes away the whole idea of subjectivity mm -hmm. from identity. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you think that's, that's happening? Do you think yeah. that anyone who's a minority, for example, women, blacks, Jews, whatever, doesn't matter who, which minority you pick, mm -hmm. do you think you automatically lose the control over the subject of your identity? You know, I think it's a mistake to read my book as about identity, because it really isn't. Mm -hmm. It's about the construction of a particular kind of identity, a national identity. And it's about the construction of a national subject and a national subject position that can be claimed by some people, not by others, living in the same uh, uh, geographical territory subject to the same state, and yet it can be claimed by certain people and not others. So my book really isn't about identity. I think that's a, a, a you know that is a misreading of my book. Okay. It really is about a particular national identity, a Canadian national identity, and I try and look at you know at particular historical moments how this identity has been constructed what role the state has played in the construction of this identity, <coughs> what, what role, quote unquote, prominent Canadians have mm. played, right, okay. in, in defining this sure. identity. Right. Uh, and uh, so, so it really isn't about identity. It really is about Which the construction of a Canadian national identity. Do you, do you mind right? if I pick that, up on that, Samir? Yes, that's please we, do. We, yeah. we, um, We've spoken a little bit about what it's like to be denied that identity or to not have access to it, to, for your daughter to be asked for her passport yeah. repeatedly, to never shed the ethnic skin. Yeah. Um, so we'll, let's look, let's visit the other side about um, the socialization of children into that um, national identity. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter as well. She ha Her heritage is Greek and Afghan, but I watch every day as she learns songs that come out of Western Europe. Um, that she learns about individualism, that mm -hmm. she cherishes uh, a sense of space that doesn't come from my ethnic background nor my partner's. And so I watch her become a culture that's not mine. Right. And uh, so the state is taking her from me, the education system is taking her from me, consumerism is taking her from me. And you know, she can take Greek school class and Farsi class, but those are just her way of staying, you know, part of the multicultural other that is on that. <coughs> yes. Peer system, but I mean, she is so far removed, though, that it's almost like a tourism for her right. to go to these classes. 
So uh, uh, what do we do, right? I mean, on the one hand, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's yes. your opportunity to talk That's about right. agency, yes. but at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the tragedy of people of color in this country is that our inclusion in the national project has in some ways been the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, 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 that these are, you know, I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I want to tell you stories <laughs> about other, other children and, and how, how, um, how, how do you deal with that? How do you resist it? And I think that, A, you have to be very clear about the kind of society you're living in, which for me begins with naming it for what it is, a white settler society. It's being very clear about the, the kind of uh, power relations of race that we have to negotiate every day, uh, teaching our children, my daughter certainly, to, I've tried to teach her uh, to recognize those power relations, to uh, um, name them for what they are, to not to internalize them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that for people of color, the, the kind of discourse around multiculturalism has been so strong. And it has seduced so many children of color who've been raised in this society. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, really in terms of uh, deconstructing what multiculturalism is. And I think teaching children the skills to be able to do that effectively. The school system doesn't do that, right? I mean, my, my daughter went you know, right through high school and, and even through, through university without reading any critical race scholars who've written about Canada. Hmm? So the school system fails, fails, um, fails our children. And the, and the children who do succeed within this uh, this system uh, are, Reprodu are, are are actually you know are in in a way uh, I know it sounds really dramatic but it's like they're taken away from us <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they become integrated into this Canadianness to a certain extent uh, so I think for me the the strategy is really around uh, recognizing the kind of society that we live in mm -hmm. how central race is to that society how central it is to how children get treated within the school system, the kinds of you know, relationships that they then become embroiled. And really naming them for what they are, and then you know, uh, sort of trying to teach them to recognize that. Uh, and and, and, and you know, I mean, resistance is a big word. Uh, but to try and you know resist them as much as they can. Yeah. But, Meaning, but meaningful me, resistance. Meaningful yeah. resistance, mm -hmm. but also you know, the naming of it is very, very important for mm -hmm. me. The, the naming of it, and, and, and raising children in an, an environment where they can name it too, mm -hmm. where you know, they don't doubt their own experience yes. in, in a way that many of us do end up doubting our own experience. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, I, 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 I teach, so I, I, have school who, uh, ch uh, I have children who come, no, not children, they are young adults, who come straight out of high school. And they are so, in, because it's devastating. It's devastating to, see the extent of uh, racialization and racism that you have to live with. And I think that what I see with a, young of, a lot of the young people I teach is that, you know, the, the denial of the level and extent of it becomes a survival strategy. Um, right? It becomes Absolutely. a survival strategy. Yes, you, that's you how they it, get yeah. through this horrendous experience. Yes, that's right. um, and so, you know, in a way, it becomes a very difficult kind of project to t take that, that that strategy away from them and yet also be able to help them build the strength and, 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 the, um, and the confidence to really live without that, as, that strategy as an option. Right. But, but you know, I mean, children of color who go through this education system depend on that denial for their survival. Sure. They, you know, otherwise, I mean, I think they would be quite devastated. Yes. So it's, it's a very hard question. I wish there was an easy answer. I struggle with it as a mother, mm -hmm. and I struggle with it as an academic. I have young women of color, South Asian women, second, third generation. They come to my women's studies courses, and they want to write papers about dowry deaths, about bright burnings, about female genital mutilation, mm -hmm. and you know. But not about breast implants, right? No, or like no, 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 no exactly. No, 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 no. No. But but the thing I find is that most of them actually have no knowledge about their own history in this country. Right. They have no knowledge about the the history of immigration citizenship policies in this country. If they do know something, they might have heard about the Komagata Maru, 
And that's one thing that they might be aware of, but that happened such a long time. And anyway, we managed to get access to citizenship. <coughs> and so they're not taught this history in any meaningful way that could be empowering for them. And, and I guess part of my project uh, is really to, you know, to also teach that history in some way right. that, that, you know, mm -hmm. um, it helps bring about some level of transformation. So it's a very <coughs> difficult question. It's a very painful question when you have to work with it every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the place from which my book comes. <laughs> right. I wanted to understand it myself. Yeah. It doesn't how, come how, up as a testimonial, but yeah, of course but it comes from lived realities, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, somebody read my book and, and said, thank God it's not a rant. Because I guess, having been president of NAC, that's what they were expecting. <laughs> and I said, you think this is not a rant? It is a rant. It's, it's very painful to deal with these questions. But you know, there's just no, no easy answer, and there's no easy way, except for uh, making that knowledge, that information, that level of analysis, developing it. Yes. Um, and, 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 and you know, equipping them to survive in this society, which will only let them survive in the role of the supplicant, right? Mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at, the, at the price of becoming complicit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to some extent, you can't blame them. That's what they have to do to survive. That's, right. That's what they have to do. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah. All right. uh, we're talking about history, so actually, uh, that's why I jumped in earlier mistakenly thinking you were referring back to the first settler society in Canada, which was 1608, Quebec City. Um, this year, this is the 400th year anniversary. And I'm from Quebec, I'm from Montreal. Okay. Um, and I also grew up speaking French, so I've followed the way this is being presented uh, mm -hmm. in the media. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be celebrated as the founding of two nations. Right? First is the, the real Quebecois nation, and you know the little spectacle of, you know, now, the nationalists come out and say, no, it's all about Quebec and yes. Canada, and don't invite the Queen, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you can use that excellent concept of embodying discourses, uh, the way you use it, I think, to explicate this concept of exalted subjects. Mm -hmm. I mean, could use that and maybe, maybe in a sense, just tell us what you think about this celebration. I don't think it's, you discuss it in the book, but no. it, it's clearly an event that is being used and deployed yes. to continue the kind of uh, nation formation that you, yes. you write about. Yes. Um, I was, I'm glad actually that it's taking place this summer, all these festivities, right. uh, because we're having our conference this summer. So, mm. uh, and even next summer, I'd like to articulate more, you know, and give voice, speeches, yes. embody this. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What is it exactly that we're celebrating so, in Quebec City? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could. Yeah, yeah. Talk. Well, the f first thing that comes to mind is, you know, uh, the big kind of gap in my book really is around Quebec. Yeah. Because I don't deal specifically with Quebec, I haven't looked at Quebec at all in in in, in Can I my just work. Ask you this question because I have you here, but that seems to me coming from Quebec. Yes. To be very characteristic of English Canada. Yes. This singular inability yes. to speak to actual events going on in Quebec. Yes. Not this, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, yeah. this is not necessarily a criticism. It's just something that it really strikes me when, even when I raise it, and coming here to Ontario, raise mm -hmm. questions, you almost feel. There's almost talk about complicity. There's, yeah. You're not supposed to talk about the other nation, yeah. or you know, you don't want to deal with anything that's uncomfortable or nasty. Yeah. We just had a truth, uh, you know, commission in Quebec uh, called reasonable accommodation. Yes, yes. Of immigrants. Yes. You must have heard of that. Yes, I have heard of that. Yeah, you should see. Yes. Read some of the reports that came out of that. I'm going to. <laughs> outside of yeah, Montreal. I am. Yes, I am. You want to see discourses that actually both embody and disembody immigrants yes. and refugees yes. in the name of nation building here, the Quebecois nation. Yes. You just have to look. I mean, the report will come out. Uh, the great uh, Charles Taylor will be uh, mm. telling us exactly what happened. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then yeah. Bouchard, so. Yeah. Please. Well, I won't take responsibility for the kind of historical <laughs> exclusion no, I, I of Quebec. I'm not, I didn't but in mean my that. book, I didn't mean it that but way. I no, but I just want to contextualize. I just want to contextualize my my kind of answer because yeah. I, I I don't actually look at Quebec in the book yeah. at all. I mean, I think there are some similarities, but you know, of course, there are great yeah. differences as well. So I I don't actually deal with Quebec. But you know, one one I mean the 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 kind of. 400 year anniversary, mm -hmm. the question, what are we celebrating? Mm -hmm. And it's really genocide that we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that there's a whole 
of critique around that that you know I think you know many more, people more in this room would be too, mm. just after that settlement two genocides mm -hmm. in the six, late 1600s mm -hmm. in his book right a little matter of genocide right. so yeah yeah absolutely. so I, I think that you know but but for me what is more interesting and this is you know I use Sarah Ahmed's work a lot right mm -hmm. and Sarah Ahmed's notion of strange encounters right mm -hmm. where she talks about um, outside you know uh, immigrants, people of color, mm -hmm. outsiders being constructed as strangers to the nation. And mm -hmm. she argues that, you know, that, that they are, they are uh, constructed as strangers even before the encounter takes place. You already recognize somebody as being strange, right, mm -hmm. to label them a stranger. Uh, but she talks about the importance of what she calls this strange encounters, that it's in these encounters that these historical relations get reproduced at the level of the everyday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that the anniversary, the 400-year anniversary or whatever, you know, in Vancouver, like we celebrated the 100th or the 125th year anniversary, I think those are, are in a way, much more easier to, uh, to criticize, to, you know, to, to look at, at, at the, at the, at the um, what do I want to say, at, at, at uh, what they accomplish and what they're intended to do. Mm -hmm. Those are easier to kind of you know criticize, but but for me, what is much more interesting is this everyday level at which these strange encounters get reproduced, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and that's why my book looks at those kinds of practices, right. that you know what I call the the, the sort of uh, rituals of race and the rites of race, R I T E S, right, that they get produced at the level of the everyday, mm -hmm. and that's where my work is really much more kind of situated in looking at how these not just this kind of commemorations of what then gets constructed as past history or wasn't that terrible what was done and you know so the appropriate apology is made but, and, connect the two, but we've moved it yeah you connect the two yeah you connect the two and and it's very important to kind of you know deconstruct those kinds of of events practices and what they accomplish but i'm much more interested in looking at how they get reproduced at the site of the everyday so it's yeah. not just the 400 year level anniversary that yeah. that that but it's it's the you know where are you really from you know mm -hmm. uh, it's the uh, you know yeah. if you go to a welfare office where's your passport right it's at that level mm -hmm. that i want to look at how this nation gets reproduced hmm? uh, uh, at, at the site of the everyday in the everyday so, so I guess my book is very much, you know, so uh, looking focused at the conditions at it. It's looking at that. Yeah, because for me, those are also the possibilities for for, yeah, for resistance and for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's an ideal way to build this sense of national identity? In a is there an ideal way to? Uh, in, in your opinion, <laughs> what 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 do you think is the is the way? Well, I don't think there is a way. <laughs> I don't think there is a way. And you know, I'm talking about a very particular historical experience. And, and, and that's what I want to kind of stick to that. I don't want to make these grand generalizations. Because it's a very particular kind of study of very particular practices and very particular policies. So I don't want to make any grand claims from that. It's culturally specific. But it's, yes, it is. It's very specific to Canada. I mean, I think some yeah, things well, translate saying, to all yeah. settler societies. Right? No, I'm I think they do. Canada, but, how would what would people have to do to build a Canadian national identity in a way that's different from what they're doing now? Well, I mean, the, the thing that would have to be, it wouldn't have to be Canadian. It wouldn't have to be Canadian, right? If you were to take Aboriginal sovereignty and the claims <coughs> of Aboriginal peoples really seriously, mm -hmm. then you really, it couldn't be Canadian, right? If there was justice for Aboriginal people, you wouldn't have Canada in the way that it is now. It would have to be other than how we think about Canadian today. Right? right? It would have to be other than. And would it have to be a national identity? I don't know, you know? But it couldn't be as, as we know today. It couldn't be a national identity as we know today. For Aboriginal people to achieve justice, that wouldn't be possible. Right? I see. Okay. So just, just based on that then, no, no, go ahead. Um, just based on that then, the, uh, like we're all familiar with the, the critiques of, of Canadian multiculturalism. Yes. Um, but um, not in a not in an idealized way, but in a real way. Then does that mean that that uh, something like a like a multiculturalism, uh, a true multiculturalism, mm -hmm. um, is something that's mm -hmm. that's an actual possibility, or 
or is it too embedded in, in perhaps uh, the concepts of liberal democracy and the state form to actually come to any sort of real fruition? Like, I, I mean, I'm thinking here in terms of a, a new type of identity. Yeah, yeah. Well, a new type of identity, a true multiculturalism, you know, I don't know what that would mean. It's so abstract. You know, you can theorize about it, but if we look at multiculturalism in Canada and, you know, and, and could we have a true multiculturalism at the same time as you have uh, bilingualism, biculturalism, at the, at the same time as you have the concept of the two <coughs> founding nations? Clearly not. Clearly not, right? And would it, if you had a true multiculturalism, would it be emanating from the state as a policy to deal with the claims of ethnic communities, which is where multiculturalism comes from? Could it be that? Clearly not, right? So uh, I don't know. I mean, you can sort of try and, uh, and, 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 uh, and theorize what it might or could <coughs> possibly look like. But Canadian multiculturalism cannot become it. Yeah, definitely yeah? not. Canadian multiculturalism yeah, cannot, cannot become it.